Well, I've loved the Academy of Readings that I've been at. I love Boris. <clears throat> uh, but I've been very moved by the context of art. So I, the reading today is very art-heavy. Uh, I've been working a lot with artists in different ways and in different senses, and I want to introduce a word, an old word from Latin that's been in English for a while, but nobody seems to use it anymore. Uh, I'm tired of talking about photos and paintings and gouaches and encaustics, and I want to introduce the word picture, um, a word once familiar in the days of Life magazine and things like that. Pictures, we looked at pictures. <clears throat> so I have a lot of texts here that are about pictures. But first of all, I want to read a poem that is about art, or the something of art, or the roots of. It's very far away. Like art. Does this okay, do yeah. things? Well, it does things. Perhaps I needed to do a bit of a taller thing. How up would you like it? Oh, that's very nice. Is that good? That's good. Okay. Enough aqua. Okay. Thank you very much. The roots of. I have opened the seals and found the roots. And they are these. They are here. They are you. You know all this stuff. It is in you. The mother and the father and the hand on the wall. The moon to line up against the hill and measure. The sun to make the animals hide. Hide is die said backwards. Do you know that now? And no shady caves for us, none of that. We were out on the lawn, drinking tea from the very beginning. From the beginning, weird leaf in dubious water boiled. That cave was for Sunday morning, midnight revel, church. And the signs of things we made with our hands, anything a hand could sign, another hand could carve in the rock. And nothing happened for 50,000 years to Johann Sebastian Bach. Or the slim but clumsy fishing boats came into Sheepshead Bay Friday evenings always late, laden with flounder but mostly fluke. We'd bring home glad enough, mystery of the bottom of the sea, both eyes on one side of the head and a firm white flesh, not delicate as flounder is, let alone soul a decent, a frying, scraped skin and bones sinful in the sink. Why have I waited to hear myself speak under the broad channel causey, the never fulfilled rockaway yearning to handle the machinery of things, to turn the crank of the ocean and make the thing work? The girls of the town in the courtyard set to more than dancing as some human body with color in its blood sets words to music the grass knows how to sway when the piper tells. Hemoglobin rhapsody, the valiant orgasms of the Stone Age, dragged us out of the Alaya. Here, the surface of the earth is the bottom of a sea. Bottom of the sea, bottom of the cup, something lives that you can't see. Identical mystery, the yelling seagulls mock me for not understanding. Even then I knew it was about the sea. That big animal had to make up its mind about me Things put up with being worshipped for a while. Her skin was white and she was slim. It was eternity. I had hands, four years old, no one to tell me, no one I trusted. The crucifix attacked me at night. No one to tell me, no one to ask. The hated nuns ask the wrong kind of questions, the ones whose answers are all in some book. I knew all that stuff. I wanted to know what I didn't know. I was convinced in elo tempore that somebody knew, but who, I don't know. Lying Borges counting birds in the sky, Tommy Lomano flying his pigeons from the roof on Crescent Street, where they wheeled over the lake, where the empty lots began, the fields around the church, the marching band blaring what later came to make me think, Verdi's force of destiny, the overture to everything. But it was so much, so blaring, so satin breast, so oil, so animal, so close together, so old man laughing, so clackety whirl of the tumble of the screams, so sugar dread, so zeppily, so hip thrust jostling, that it might just as well have been nothing at all. And into that nothing I had spent what I had, and still seem to have more. Because memory is a bottomless pool, and everything that swims down there is just a reflection on the surface. Water is skin deep. 
And all this stuff I remember is the shadow a body casts on the mind right now. And now is a very different mystery. Uh, so a few weeks ago, if I haven't lost it, a few weeks ago, a young sculptor friend out west sent me in a letter, a quotation from a letter that Dorothea Tanning had written to Joseph Cornell in 1948. I was 13 and didn't know anything about it at the time, but that's what was going on. Well, I was 13 and walking around Santa Cornelata Church looking at the Zeppelin being boiled in the oil. She was writing to Joseph Cornell saying, all I live for is art. All the rest I see around me just creates revulsion. It was a very unhappy letter. You remember Dorothea Tanning, who just died last year, or the late last year, uh, a woman I later corresponded with when she was in her 90s. She died at 101, I think. She was married at this time to Max Ernst, whom I didn't know particularly. So he's referred to it. So <clears throat> I imagine that when I read this letter, Revolution struck me so, so powerfully that I imagine what Joseph Cornell might have written in this. So I've written Joseph Cornell's letter to Dorothea Tanner, answering yours of March 3rd, 1948. Dear Dorothea, revulsion, a terrible word, and I grieve that you find it in things around you. And you ask me, do you ask me? How I live away from revulsion. I have had the grace to live at some distance from my feelings, though always acutely aware of them. How could I not be living in the world? But I long ago reasoned that a feeling is just something I feel. At an earlier time, I felt it some other way. Later, I will feel some other way. Why should I privilege this feeling I feel now? I examine it. Sometimes I use it to choose or change things around me, real things objects and shapes, things that are my salvation in a way, and I suspect they help you too, the marvelous objects that crowd the people world in your paintings. The feelings are not much help. Things are. I have been called a fetishist, I know, by some of our Freudian friends. Can a Freudian be a real friend? <laughs> <laughs> I admit it. I am a fetishist, and my fetish is matter. People say that I live with my mother. True enough, because a mother is a quiet world. A mother is someone always to be traveling from. From her, my body, and all it's going. So I go, but I keep looking back over my shoulder to see her there in the quiet Sunday afternoon light of Queens. People say that I live with my mother, but the truth of the matter is I live with matter. That strange bird. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the body is a sheen of glory with nothing inside it. The skin is our panoply and declaration. We artists are so fortunate because we are the servants and masters of the visual world, the world of shape and color, form and geometry, tension and release. We are the lords and ladies of blank space. And all that happens to fill it. We know that what we see when we look, it with our artist, loving, judging, smart, tender, broken eyes, when we look at someone standing there, we see the utter and absolute truth of him. We say, I see you. And that is exactly right. When I look at him, I see him. I see all there is. Poets and psychiatrists and philosophers and other types who do not have the grace of seeing they talk about personality and character and inner motivation and neurosis and meaning and drives and complexes, complexes and memory and desire. They rave on and on about those things and think that such things somehow live inside the person they have before them, the person they don't know how to see. All that stuff, all that cognitive crap, forgive the coarse word, my dear, mama isn't looking, all that crap is lies. Personality is a lie. Psychology is a lie. People say I make my little boxes focused environments to represent the tumult of repressed images and confusions in me. Not at all. 
My boxes express nothing but themselves. Don't people understand that artists aren't spewing out their guts? They're adding things to the world. We are increasing the intensity and beauty of matter. And one day matter itself will be perfect and complete, and this will be heaven. Our heaven, because we made it so and knew it true. When you look at a man or a woman, there is just this glorious shimmer in front of you, a shimmer that you also are. Shimmer looks at shimmer, shimmers shimmer onto the canvas or into the marble. Sculpture is an ancient joke. I love it, turning light into stone. That is our work. We can see everything. Sometimes we can even touch what we see. And that is wonderful because beauty is skin deep. Reality is skin deep. Did you know, who told me this, that the, world, that the word skin is the same as the words shine and sheen? They just came into the language at different times. What we see is the skin of things, and all there is is skin. Go through the skin, and you come into a howling nightmare where surgeons and demons torture flesh they imagine it to be. But there is nothing there but what we see. God bless you for seeing so much of what is there and so little of what isn't. Please always be with me in seeing the world and speaking or shaping or singing or limning it into new embodiments. This is what I know, and this is what keeps me happy. Happy as I hope you will always be. Your loving brother, Joseph. P.S. Give my best wishes to Max. I'm not sure if you should show him this letter. <laughs> <laughs> He's a German, and they believe things have insides. <laughs> it might shock or disturb him. And there is no virtue in disturbing an artist. Let him follow his nightingale even if it leads into the imaginary forest inside. Annandale on Hudson, 18th March, 2012. <laughs> so, um, I've been, as I say, working a lot of <laughs> We were held up on our way here, serving freight cars. That's it. Did any of you see the train today? Going much slower than that. There were a dozen or so freight cars that weren't freight cars, they were just frames. The shape and size of the freight cars, but there was nothing in them, just space. As if the <laughs> fucking railway to <clears throat> railway art <laughs> images of <laughs> <laughs> sailboat fuel. Eh? They're carrying sailboat fuel. <laughs> So I've been working a lot with, with painting, but I've had the good luck of working with a number of living artists. And I wanted to read just three recent results. Two of them are, are here in this room, in fact. Um, last year, I worked on some collages by Barbara Leon. And more recently, I was looking at a large picture of hers. I think it's in the show down at Dvorsky, in New Paltz huge green figure. Trying to see everything. A green woman standing in the woods. Love that sound. The dragon growling. is called, I remember now, Homo Naturalis, or Natural Man. Great, great thing. But this is just thinking towards it. Trying to use everything, a green woman standing in the woods, naked is my thought of her, a new myth birthing out of old leaves. As on your midnight fence, dried hydrangeas six months past summer, colorless under a foolish moon. I must make a woman for your man, but mine must be words, 
but mine must also let some skin show through, shine of a shank, soft of a thigh. We are nature. We tell each other into being. And there is no one here who is not us, the morphology. We are trees that walk around. I should say, by the way, that all that I'm reading today is fairly recent work. And I don't like to read older work very much. Okay. I've been looking, too, at a lot of pictures by Susan Quasha. But I would just say pictures. And the pictures don't have names, so I'm just referring to my own mind of passion words. And I've been working on a series of responses called templations. The word temple or temple comes from the Latin word templum, which means a space designated as special in some way, a place to look at, something to regard. So that in ancient times, the order who was, would mark out a place on the ground and see what fall into it. Or he would look, mark out a space in heaven, the way he would look up and divide the sky into four templa. And watch what happened there. Birds, lightning, wind, whatever was going on. And you would interpret it. So a templum is any space marked out for special observation. So this piece is called, temp and our word contemplate comes from that. But that word has become so wussy all the time. <laughs> it's hard to do anything with it. So I'm calling these templations. Now this is from one of Susan's pictures. It is real, that is, the grace of thingliness inhabits it. It makes sense from any language. It is the pure sign, can't be interpreted. The final mystery is clarity. Something right here, the unnameable, full of reminders of other names, lost loves, burnt down forests, ancient water on the moon in the light of eclipse. It wants me to leap up, to meet it by looking, confuses my grammar like an unexpected hand on the skin of your back. Who knows who touches me? We are far from the Iliad where even the nights are bright and the watchfires still are blazing on the beach. If I just turn my head, the sea is made of wood. Or the sea, too, is on fire. But that's how it seems to me. So this is about me, not it, you know? It sneers at me with the beautiful sneer, say, of self-indulgent Isabella d'Este, that pretty girl with the snake around her neck, all colors of the earth. And this is what the snake was thinking. She scratched the light to let the darkness in. When you climb the rock, you can't see the color of the rock. You almost are. The color of time from far away. Sunset in the mind. And while I'm on pictures, there's uh, Matthew Pavosti, Philip Farnbury's consort, lovely woman, black and white painting. This is one of hers, one from a text of hers that I apologized to Lou and Thomas for earlier on because it's very theologically naughty. Um, <laughs> it, I, 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 I don't have the picture of the picture. It's black and white and red and reddish and solid. Take me and um, Throw me into that picture there, make me very small, and tear me up a bit, and it means something like that. Both right? <laughs> pictures are the same picture if you make adjustments. This was Saint Photoshop, and they're now demonstrating that Leonardo painted every painting. So I was from that time. Read the words of the French press. The Le Monde talks about that one. So this one is for Natalie's painting with the haunting title of 2012 4 equals 12 11 29. Uh, I don't know what that means, but that's its time. Tear the Torah, tear the page, till there's nothing left to read. Then the Bible will tell the truth, that luminous blasphemy by which we live. 
silence, blue silence, silence the colour of rust, silence the colour of a word torn in half, then half again. How many times can you fold it and tear it? How many words can you hear in a word? A silence, I mean, a silence that means me. Is that the same thing as looking at something that can't look back? We are so hopelessly invisible. In this small world, hardly anybody sees anybody else. We move like elvers in a vast ocean, all on our way to the same place, the marshlands of Atlantis. They had no money there, only words. The words got written down and passed from hand to hand. Traded for a glass of milk, a cottage down by the canal with a hole in the thatched roof to let the rain god in. Raga Nisha Puru, Ravi Shankar's play, the sound of paper tearing to let the light through. Hindustani music knows all of the ways that music knows and then knows something else. Over the hill, the sound of the moon rising. We heard about those mountains of Montana. I want to read a little piece of nasty. Can I read one nasty piece? Uh, I don't offend too many people here. So. <laughs> Poets are the dogs of society. They come in all different breeds and shapes and textures, but all of them are noisy. <laughs> demand ceaseless attention, need to be fed, walked, <coughs> played with, crossed. When they fight, it is usually only with one another. <laughs> they do no work and are useless most of the time. Often bite the hand that feeds them. They are lazy and restless at once, and are both subjects and objects of specious love and iffy devotion, easy <laughs> sentiments. I have prepared to read a poem about that too. For Michael Ives, one of the poets who can't be here today, like Pierre and, and Nicole and Mary and Michael and John Woods. Oh, it's a busy day in the world. Anyway, Michael was saying that when his, maybe his first girlfriend, I'm not sure quite who she was in the sequence of his life, but when he was quite young, I'll say he was 18, he met a girl who was, we'll say, 28, something like that, 10 years and he followed her out west. And his, his vision of out west was a buffalo or something standing on the plain in Montana with the mountains behind him. And it, it haunted me, the notion of the young Michael, he's not so old now, but the young Michael, very young Michael, traveling in search of a mountain or a girl or a plain. Or America, I guess that's what it is. When you're born in New York, America always seems to be somewhere else. So getting there for Michael Lyles. <clears throat> Whom had I followed, or would have seen a Mustang prancing in Montana? A meadow I never. No one will ever get there. The Kodachrome flowers are old as magazines. The books we read, full of the truth, time turns into lies, and the shattered grammar of the middle class. We scoop the dust up, the sanguine dirt, to heap a little mound up a man could stand on to see six inches further. Over that unspeakable prairie runs from Vienna to Ohio with only a stupid ocean in between. In friendship you see, standing there at last, the dream place, dimly, the flowers that smell like cigars. Well, what is the geometry of that geography? How much further does the eye reach? over the ultimately flat Pusta Savannah steppes, noetic grasslands of America, how many miles ahead for each inch in elevation. We are preposterous because we love so much and hope so hard. The orchestra is broken. Only the uplifted hand can fix it by falling, as we by failing. 
write the new history of this world. Another mean poem, but this is mean about me rather than the other. Difficult poetry. You know, uh, Charles Brunson has a book called The Attack of the Difficult Poem. <coughs> they don't attack, they lie there and growl But this is difficult. Make it hard. Make them bruise their soft asses at the reading desk, studying so long. But by then they'll know more than you did when you wrote it down. They will look at you like Botticelli's. You will feel proud, maybe a little bit ashamed. <laughs> One more little poem. Uh, we're missing Siegfried now, as I pointed out before. A wonderful opera, played not so wonderfully at the Met today. Um, I guess. This was written uh, last week, I guess, when... Uh, like, wonderful. Polish tenor, Piotr Beczawa. Sang Werther uh, and that with two Anna Matrepkos, Manon. This is the poem. She's dying now, the stage holds so many deaths, each one a song, and each death can sing a thousand times. Yes, this is my hand, and yes, these are the lips that spoke so many tricky truths to you, the lips you kissed. The violins are waiting for my last breath. Music is seldom patient. I must get on with my dying. It is mine. It is the most beautiful thing I will ever do. Now, I have, as some of you know, a superstition that I have to read at, at the end of any reading. I give the most recent piece I've written. This brings us to this morning when I was re writing a set of noetic hymns at the time, it's, I seemed to know what that was. But that's hours and hours ago. So the first noetic hymn, that's, that's complete sort of. The second one, I don't think so. I just have to find it, see if I can actually read it. Only the first one is finished. Let me read you the first noetic hymn. Maybe I can read the second to anyone. The first noetic hymn is, is a hymn, it's like the Orphic hymns to a god or to a deity. And this is to the deity the Greeks called Nous, and that the English pronounce Nous, and mean by it no more than common sense or something silly. But Nous was mind, the profound mind, the ancient. So the first noetic hymn is Nous. Let them love me. I woke up thinking this morning, let them love me. Why would they do it? Why would they do it? How can I make them? No, no. <laughs> Let them love me for what you make me say. For I was Orpheus, and you are. There is a mind beyond my mind, and all I do is shape what it comes through me to become, or I become. The Greeks said, autos, allos, self and other. I am, you make me be, the opposite of autistic. I am allistic, your voice in my mouth. All I care for is what you feel, you make me feel. That's the first of the hymns. And find it. Now, try the third noetic hymn. It's very short. Um, you know how to draw a, a star? So that you make a five pointed star without lifting the pencil, the unicursal pentagram. My father taught me to do that. Whenever I do it, I do it a lot. I think of him. I'm extremely sentimental. This is the third Noetic hymn. Can... The unicursal pentagram remembers my father. A bus comes by remembering Brooklyn. Wind tosses new-leafed branches. The old sticks move again. The wind can find me now. Move me. The road is empty. Remembers the back of my mind. Thank you.